On behalf of the trustees and faculty of the Robert E. Weber Institute for Worship Studies, I welcome our guest preacher for this evening. Dr. Lester Ruth is the research professor of Christian worship at Duke Divinity School and a former professor here at IWS where he taught the historical survey component of the first DWS course from 2001 to 2015. Dr. Earth, Dr. Ruth earned, believe it or not, a Bachelor of Business Accountancy, correct? Yeah. You'll hear more about that tomorrow, those of you who are coming, at uh, Stephen F. Austin State University, an MDiv from Asbury Theological Seminary, a THM from Candler School of Theology, an MA from Notre Dame University, and a PhD in liturgical history, also from the University of Notre Dame. You don't have enough degrees yet, Lester. You need some more degrees, I think. Lester Ruth is a historian of Christian worship with particular interest in early church and in the last 250 years, especially the history of contemporary worship. He is passionate about enriching the worship life of current congregations, regardless of style. He believes that careful reflection on the worship of other Christians, whether past or present, whether Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Eastern Orthodox, can serve to enrich the church today. Lately, he's been bringing that approach to inspire contemporary songwriters, having grown concerned about a lack, listen to this, of a Trinitarian dimension in so much worship music. Dr. Ruth is ordained in the United Methodist Church and has taught pastoral and historical approaches to worship at a variety of institutions, including Yale Divinity School, Asbury Theological Seminary, and Duke Divinity School. At Duke, he is perhaps the most avid fan of the Duke women's basketball on the faculty. Is that true? <laughs> okay. Dr. Ruth is a member of the Charles Wesley Society and served recently as the president of that society. He has authored or co-authored numerous books, including his most recent publications entitled Worshiping with the Anaheim Vineyard, The Emergence of Contemporary Worship, which is co-authored uh, with vineyard musicians Andy Park and Cindy Rethmeyer, and his newest book, Loving on Jesus, A Concise History of Contemporary Worship, co-authored with Sui Hung Lim. He is married to his wife, Carmen, and they have two lovely grown children. It is an honor to welcome Dr. Lester Ruth back to the pulpit of the Robert E. Weber Institute for Worship Studies. Thank you so very much, Jim. Uh, the idea of working on another degree, uh, perhaps I just don't like contemplating having to fill out the admission stuff one more time. <laughs> There's a psalm that says, the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. Whenever I come to IWS, I step inside those pleasant places boundary lines, especially the people that are here. Thank you very much. Let me just say that there are days, and then there are days. There are average days delightful in their own ways, and then there are days where joy and happiness are overpowering. I might call them an MFPDS day, mega Facebook picture day. <laughs> you know, the days when the event celebrated is so delightful that you deluge your Facebook page with pictures of the happy occasion. And not just ordinary photos but the kind where the smiles are so big and bright that, that there's a danger that those smiles will be burned into computer screens. Screensavers were made for days like that. There are days, and then there are days. There are average days, and then there are days where the joy and relief and delight and release and everything else that makes the human spirit soar are overpowering. Today, is one of those days. I am friends on Facebook with enough IWS alumni, there they are over there, and current students, that I know that in this room there are cameras and cell phones galore on the standby. 
There are in this room itchy fingers already fiddling with the shutter button. There are in this room folks who've already quit listening to this sermon <laughs> and about the thinking about the composition of the post-service pictures. There are people in this room who are already weighing whether or not they're going to disregard the comment or the instructions not to clap for everyone until everyone has been graduated. Because this is one of those days. Go ahead and admit it. There's no shame and there's no guilt. There are days and then there are days, and today is one of those days of overpowering happiness and relief, and rightly so. Graduations are one of those days of utter delight. It has been a long haul, a marathon, a long, hard winter of work to get to this point. Is that not right? It has been a grueling journey to get to here. The travel, the expense, the time, the reading, the writing, the remolding, the tensions, and the sacrifices of both students and their families stand behind this day. But now, today, the winter is over. The crocus has stuck its head out of the soil and has bloomed in the profuse purple of delight. The winter is over and the azaleas and the forsythia are carpeting the landscape in the colors of graduation. The winter is over and the sunshine of happiness is piercing the gray clouds of exhaustion and busyness. There are days and then there are days. Today is one of those days. And it might have seemed like you were never going to get here. There are times and situations where time seems, seems to stand still and movement forward is well, now, well near to impossible. I remember once when I was a young teenager, my dad took me goose hunting on the Gulf Coast of Texas. It was fun until it came time for me to retrieve a goose I had shot. For some reason, they had left me in a blind by myself with no dog. In retrospect, that seems kind of suspicious to me now. But I shot this goose, I had waders on, and I started to walk to where the goose was, and that's when the muck in the mud grabbed hold of me. It didn't just seem to cover my feet, it didn't just seem to cover my ankles, or my calves, or my knees, it seemed to suck my whole lower body in. I'm sure that wasn't true. But it was all I could do to move one foot forward to get to that goose. You have been stuck in the muck and the mire. Muck. Thy name is 2,000 pages of reading. <laughs> Meyer, thy name is Thesis. <laughs> or it might have seemed like you would exhaust all of your energy before crossing this academic finish line. For some reason, my oldest child, Carissa, decided to take up cross-country running as a junior in high school. We were totally surprised because running does not run, excuse the pun, in the Ruth family. If you looked at the children's picture Bibles in our household, uh, the images of Moses coming down with the two tablets and the commandments, uh, the, the versions in our um, household had 11 commandments on them, the 11th being, thou shall not run. But for some reason, she decided to run cross country. I remember her first race on the rolling bluegrass fields outside of Lexington, Kentucky. The race started and she flushed with excitement the first day of class. Flushed with excitement and adrenaline, sprinted out with the pack. But reality soon hit as inexperience and lack of conditioning caught up with her. She had gone out way too fast. But I was proud of her. She stuck it out. It might have been something just a tad more than a standing crawl. A snail moving backwards might have outpaced her at the end. <laughs> But she pulled herself, somehow willed herself across that finish line. And when she did, the relief and release and the joy were palpable. There are days. And then there are days. Where was my camera? Her finishing that race was an MFPD day. In academia, success, thy name is perseverance. There are days, and then there are days. 
Today, as you sit here in your academic regalia and the beam of countless smiles surround you on every side, you can be assured that today is one of those days of delight. And so, on behalf of myself, IWS faculty and staff, other IWS, IWS alumni, your congregations, your family, your friends, and shoot, even on a day like today, on behalf of your enemies, I have one word for you. Congratulations. And on behalf of the Bible, I have another word for you. Be careful. Be very, very careful. Because there are dangers and then there are dangers. And I'm afraid that this degree conferred on you in just a few minutes could put you at a grave risk in the church. There are unreason already unreasonable expectations heaped upon church musicians in many cases, and I fear that this degree will only up the ante for you. And what is that danger? It is the expectation that some have that musicians can make God present. My friend John Whitfleet, the director of the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship and a speaker at commencement a few years ago, tells a story about being at a conference one and a pastor came up and said, can you help us find a new musician, a worship leader for our church? And John Whitfleet asked, well, who are you looking for? And he thought the man would tell, the pastor would tell him the certain quali qualifications or qualities or sense of mission and purpose that would be a good fit for the church. But the pastor only had one answer. Oh, that's easy, he said. We're looking for someone who can make God present. No pressure on musicians there. <laughs> there are dangers, and then there are dangers. The reduction of possible qualities in a church musician to a single element, making God present, is one of those dangers. For all the doctoral students who have had me in DWS 701, you'll remember the way I describe the difference between Western and Eastern worship. If worship in the Christian East is a window, I'm not going to give a quiz right now. If worship in the Christian East is a window allowing us to see through it, and to heaven, then worship in the West has often been a hammer. It is an instrument that we Western Christians have expected will create a desired result if handled in the right way by the right person with the right intention. We want someone who can make God present. If that doesn't sound like a hammer, I don't know what does. And if it's that normal day in, day out expectation for church musicians, just generally, then what will this degree mean for other people's expectations for you? You will walk out of this room as doctors and masters of worship study. Does this mean we no longer expect you to just be a plain old hammer, but we expect you to be a jackhammer? Experts in blasting through any sort of recalcitrance, inattention, or preoccupation of the potential worshiper so that they might experience God. There are dangers, and then there are dangers. If getting this degree today has upped anyone's expectations of your ability to control the sovereign God of heaven and earth, be careful. Be very, very careful. Where did this expectation in the church come from? I believe it's a development of a certain kind of teaching based on the verse we heard today, Psalm 22:3. Specifically, it's verse 3, which says in various versions something like, You, God, are the Holy One. You are inhabit or enthroned upon the praises of Israel. I'll be speaking more on the role of this verse in the alumni seminar, but let me give you a very brief version. Simply put, the idea that God dwells in the praises of the church was one of the headwaters for contemporary worship. Where the people of God praise, the thinking was, God becomes present. And eventually this notion will get musicalized so that it is musical praise, praise that is sung that creates the dwelling for God to inhabit or the throne for God to occupy. And once you make that step, the chief musicians of the church become hammers, jackhammers for making this happen. And pastors scramble about 
for finding someone that they can wield in that way. That sort of simple approach is dangerous enough as it is, but there's often been a subtle shift to the teaching based on that psalm that I've often seen. Time and again, I've seen the verse quoted like this. Jesus inhabits the praises of Israel. That tweaking the, the psalm verse risks cutting God the Father and the Holy Spirit out of the dynamics of worship and how it is we experience God's presence in worship. If the musical interpretation of Psalm 22.3 underlined your role as a musician in worship, then that interpretation that says that music is how Christ Jesus becomes present is like taking one of those fluorescent yellow highlighters to your role as a musician. It will leap off the page and highlight it and elevate it even more. What will earning a doctor or master of worship studies do to people's expectations? Will it increase people's expectations of your ability to control the sovereign God of heaven and earth? There are dangers, and then there are dangers. The really interesting thing to me as a historian about either the original teaching of Psalm 22.3 or the Jesus is the one enthroned version is how it forgets the rest of that psalm. Take a look at the whole psalm. And the, this whole thing is about Christ crucified will leap off the page. Where does the psalm begin? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where have I heard those words before? Oh, yes. Jesus on the cross. Or look at verses 6 through 8. I am scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And yep, you're remembering correctly. That's a nice description of the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion. In verses 16 to 18 are even more obvious. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Cue Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for their accounts of Christ's crucifixion. Read the whole psalm in its entirety, and you can see how this psalm is a dramatic, prophetic recounting of the saving work, not of you, but of Jesus Christ. And not surprisingly, that makes the key praise in the psalm not our praise, but his. Christ praise of the one, God the Father, who delivers him from death. This psalm is a psalm of lament. That means there's a deterrent in it, a turning to the corner from despair and complaint to hope and trust and praise. And in this psalm, it is Christ who makes that turn, not us. Consider verse 22. I, that's the crucified Christ, will declare your name, that's God the Father's, to my brothers and sisters, that's us. In the congregation, that's us, I, that's Jesus, will praise you, that's God the Father. At least that's how the book of Hebrews that we listened to earlier took the verse. Hebrews uses that verse to talk about the wonder of Jesus Christ being willing to identify with us and the wonder of Him leading His worship of God in our very midst. If there is a worship leader here today, Jesus is His name. As we worship today, it is Christ's voice, not mine, not any other preacher's, that you should listen for for the declaration. As we worship today, it is Christ's voice, not some musician's, that you should be listening for in the praise of God. If there's any enthroning of God in our worship today or on any other day, any making God present, it is that which Christ accomplishes not you, not me, newly earned degree or not, fancy academic gown or not. 
the danger in others thinking that you can make God present, especially as you walk out of here with this degree, is in dethroning Christ from his role as the mediator between us and God. If musicians can make God present, then there, is there any reason left to still call Jesus Emmanuel, God with us? We might as well call him Hank or Fred or Sue or, heaven forbid, Lester. Now, I've gotten on a real downer here, haven't I? Sorry. Let me remind you where I began in rejoicing with you and congratulating you with the heartiest congratulations that I could. By no means am I trying to demean you or rain on your parade on this day. My warning is more for myself and for others in the church than it is for you, the new graduates. And I will admit that there is a role for music in discerning God's presence. It's not a hammer, it's a window. It's not a hammer that makes God present, but it's something that facilitates our discerning that presence. An easy way for me to think of it is to realize how nearsighted I am. If I take off my glasses, you are not here anymore. <laughs> I put on my glasses. Whoop. Now, you didn't leave. I just have some way to be able to focus in on my discernment. When I go to the eye doctors and she asks me to look at the eye chart without my glasses and tell her what I see, I have a very easy answer. Doctor, I see a white blob with what I think are some black blobs. Put on your glasses, Lester. Oh. Doctor, can I read that lowest line? My glasses don't make the eye chart present to me. They just allow me to perceive what is already present. I'd be making a mistake to confuse my glasses for the chart. I look through, not at my glasses, because they're a window, not a hammer. The music you make is like my glasses. It facilitates discerning God's presence, but it doesn't make God present. I hope that will relieve some of the stress you might be feeling. Because if God is present in our worship, whether on this delightful day, on next Sunday when you're leading worship as a newly endowed doctor or master, it is not our elevation or praise which has created a dwelling place for God on earth. That's solely the accomplishment of a degree less carpenter from a backwater village named Nazareth, the one who came to serve not be served. The one who is both fully divine and fully human. For you see, there are mediators. And then there is a mediator. Jesus Christ is his name. Oh, one last word. In light of that good news, rejoice. <laughs>